Well, hello, and just to let you know a little bit about Friendly Street, we're the longest running poetry reading and publishing group in the Southern Hemisphere. We've been going since a very unusual date, which was November the 11th, 1975, probably known for other reasons. Um, and we meet every single tu first Tuesday of the month at the South Australian Writers' Centre in the second floor auditorium every month except January, so you can always come there. Plus, we have a whole range of things going on in your community, in your libraries, at various festivals around the place. And I would encourage you to maybe in the break time, come over and get a pamphlet from over there to find out a bit more about Friendly Street if you're interested. And uh, if you want to, there's actually possibly a free book. Uh, we've also got books for sale too. Um, what's gonna be happening today, first of all, is we're gonna have three very talented readers and they are, um, and performers I should say too, and they are going to be Sean Williams, who I'll tell you a bit more about on each of them later, uh, Erica Jolly and Professor Ian Gibbons. We're also going to be having a very interesting group of young people called Science in the Street and these are going to be enthralling you. I think they're a uh, a youth group, non-for-profit organisation, and they promote communication in science through social events, workshops and demonstrations. And they're going to be doing a 10-minute, very entertaining segment for you. Um, they're in, it'll all be performed to music, and they're going to be Alicia, Erin, Karen, Matthew, Jeffrey, Sigourney and Adam. So I'll introduce those to you later. First of all, I'm going to start with Sean Williams. Now... I should tell you, first of all, in case you didn't realise, he's the number one New, York's New York Times bestseller. That's his first big claim to fame. But he has written 35 books and 75 short stories, and he says he writes the odd poem. And I think that's odd in both senses of the word, knowing him. His latest book is called Trouble Twisters, and it's a fantasy for children, and it's been co-written with Garth Nix and it's available everywhere because it's an Alan and Unwin book, good old Australian publisher. So I'd like to wait and welcome to the stage, Sean Williams. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, two things to say first up. One is um, congratulations to all the winners and the people who receive honourable mentions. Unfortunately, I have to sneak out during the ceremony, so I won't be here to applaud. But uh, please take it as read from me in advance. I'm here in spirit. The second thing I'd like to say is that I'm, I'm not used to being included in as a poet. Uh, it was quite nice to hear my name there as three poets that'll be up here tonight because I normally write novels and short stories, but I do like writing the odd, odd poem. Uh, two of my greatest loves are science uh, and words. Um, not unsurprising, I guess, for somebody who's a writer. Uh, in fact, I've tried to wear uh, clothes that um, capture, symbolise, demonstrate my two loves. One is a haiku T-shirt. Uh, it says, haikus are easy, but sometimes they don't make sense, refrigerator. <laughs> and the other thing that I'm wearing is a, a belt that has Einstein's very famous equations on them. So, so combining science and, and the written... And, and poetry and wordplay, literally embodying it. Um, science fiction, uh, which is normally what I write, science fiction and fantasy, plays with both science and words as a matter of course, uh, and that's one of the things that has drawn me to the genre. Um, I like making up my own words, um, words like evergence and geodesica and as astropolis, words like that that don't exist, that uh, have a resonance and a meaning. Um, and I like using poetry every now and again in the books that I write too. The book that Maggie mentioned earlier, Trouble Twisters, has a rhyme uh, that uh, is very, very important to the story that goes, something growing, something red, something living, someone dead. And you know, that's not going to win any awards or anything, but it's still, it's a, it's a something, Garth and I, we, we love books with poetry in them and we sort of like mucking around as well. And in the course of my work, I do occasionally get to write the odd, odd poem. And I thought I'd share a couple with you today. I, I spoke last year um, and I read some um, giant monster haiku, daikaiju haiku, monsters uh, like God, uh, Godzilla and Gamera, short poems about giant monsters. I quite like doing that kind of thing. I also read out a 
um, I adapted Charles Darwin's most famous novel, famous book um, on the origin of species and rewrote it in haiku form using Darwin's own words chapter by chapter. So each chapter was a different haiku capturing the meaning of the book but it also capturing the evolution of haiku over hundreds of years. So that was an interesting challenge too. And um, in, uh, last year, the year before, I was new scientist issued a challenge to write a story in 30 words and I thought, well, this... This could be fun, I'll try this. And what I decided to do was write, make it a little bit more harder, a little, little bit more interesting to, to write a story in eight words and make it rhyme. So uh, that's what I did. And I'll read it to you and then I'll explain to you what it means because uh, just like words like evergence and geodesica, none of these words actually exists, although it may sound as I read it that they, they do. So the, the poem is called, and there are almost more words in the title than there are in the actual poem, the actual story. The Rise and Fall of Neologopolis. That's the title. And, and it goes like this. Symbiotic neuroplasm, psychotastic infogasm, socioscopic yottophytes, retrophobic trilobites. Which means absolutely nothing. And in fact, I had to uh, look it up myself to remind myself what it meant. I'll go through word by word. So starting with the title, The Rise and Fall of Neologopolis. Neologopolis is a, is a, a, a made-up word that means um, the city of new words. So uh, there you go. The Rise and Fall of the City of New Worlds. Symbiotic. There is actually a word, symbiotic, but this is spelt slightly different. It's spelt S-I-M, not S-Y-M. So it's kind of a pun. Sim, S-I-M as in simulation. Biotic meaning life. So it's a simulated life. Symbiotic neuroplasm is the next word. Neuro from brain. Plasm from something moulded. So the word means something like a, a, a moulded brain. The third word is psychotastic. Uh, psycho, meaning the mind. Tastic, an abbreviation of fantastic. Psychotastic, kind of explanatory. Infogasm, also kind of self-explanatory. I won't go into it, given there are young, younger people here. Uh, socioscopic is the fifth word. Socioscopic, socio from society. And scopic, an instrument for viewing. So society and an instrument for viewing. The, 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 I've lost count of the words now. Sixth word, yottophytes. Now, yotta is a great word. We don't have much call for it these days. You know how we have um, kilo, mega, the little suffixes that tell you how much of something, a kilogram is a thousand grams, a megagram is a million grams. A yotta, a yotta gram would be, it's, anything that's yotta is one followed by 24 zeros. So what's that? That's, that's, a, a sextillion grams or something ridiculous like that. So it's the biggest one of these suffixes we have. So, and fight, yotta fight, fight means habitat. So yotta fight means a big habitat, I guess. Retrophobic, the second to last word, retro, backwards, phobic, and fear. And trilobites, again, we have a word, trilobite, already. But this, again, is spelt slightly differently. It's uh, T-R-I-L-O-B-Y-T-E-S instead of B-I-T-E-S which is you know, kind of a pun on, on the idea of a high-tech fossil. So, so that's the explanation of what the eight words, the nine words mean. And if you, having unpacked all these ridiculous words, then work out what the story is, it goes something like this. The rise and fall of the city of new worlds, new words. And it means something like enhanced life and evolved brains lead to ecstatic experiences in a society that views itself as the universe's greatest marvel. But, and there's often a but in this kind of cautionary tale, but in the process, humanity, humanity becomes futuristic fossils afraid of the past. Nothing particularly profound, but it was a stunt poem. I had fun writing it, and it's the kind of, one of the kinds of wordplay that I really like when I'm, when I'm uh, writing as a course of my work. This is not the usual kind of work that I do. It's the, this is the kind of stuff I do for the love of it. The second example of the kind of poetry that I explore is actually kind of a real poem. I mean, that last one's a real poem, but it's not, you know, really, it's sort of, it's a joke poem. I was uh, very fortunate a couple of years ago to be invited to write a poem for the zoo's entrance. Has anybody been to the zoo lately? 
there's a, there's a spoken word piece that you pass as you go through, and I was invited to be the person to write that poem. And it was a collaborative process between um, the Environment Institute at the Adela University of Adelaide and Zoos SA. And they wanted to design a, an audio water trail around the theme, Water is Life, focusing on the animals associated with the River Murray. So it was a very worthy, interesting project, and uh, I'd never been commissioned to write anything public before. So my first thought was, yay! My second thought was, but I'm not a poet. All the poets will hate me. <laughs> so the, 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 the first thing I did was I, ring up a, I rang up a, a poet friend of mine, Jude Aquilina, wonderful Jude Aquilina, terrific poem, poet, and I asked her two questions. I said, one, is it okay for me to do this? Am I going to have poets banging on my door, setting fire to my house because I've stolen a job? Because, you know, poets make so little money. I felt bad about that. And she said, of course, don't be stupid. And my next question to her was, will you help me? Uh, make sure that I don't make a complete fool of myself. And I'm glad that she said yes to that too, because it was a really interesting process. Um, I've done a bit of collaborative work. I've written Star Wars novels. So I know what it's like to kind of write a story and then have to hand it to somebody and they say, no, that's terrible, or no, you can't have Luke Skywalker being killed on page two because you know he's Luke Skywalker and no one wants Luke. So, so that kind of process I'm quite used to, but I, um, and that really influenced the poem as it, uh, as it evolved. And as with all poems, it came down to minute word choices. Just like in the last one, the Neologopolis poem, that came down to individual letter choices, an I versus a Y, uh, etc. And unfortunately, when that poem was published, there were two typos in it. Both my own fault. So, <laughs> so it, it's absolutely critical to get right. And same with this poem. I went through several drafts. Um, I'll read you my first draft. My, my first, I'd been falling in love with villanelles. How would you define a villanelle? It's kind of a cyclical sort of poem. It's got a lovely rolling rhythm to it. And I was mucking around with them for a while and I thought, well, I'll write a villanelle. This is my chance to do another one. Uh, so I'll read you that. Think of this next time it rains. It means much more than getting wet. The calling frog, the birds refrain, the wheat, the sheep, the sugar cane, all linked by water's vital net. Think of this next time it rains. The rivers creep across the plain, though muddy is life-giving yet. The calling frog, the birds refrain, depend on this life-giving vein to survive drought's blistering threat. Think of this next time it rains, before you pour it down the drain. Waste not, want not, don't forget the calling frog, the birds refrain. Their, so their songs need never be in vain if we ensure their needs are met. Think of this next time it rains, the calling frog, the birds refrain. So that was my first take on this idea, and we decided that wasn't quite right because it, it was a bit too naggy, a bit too telling people off. You know, they're going to the zoo to have fun with the family. They don't want me going, don't waste the water, you naughty people. So I had, we had to come up with something else. And uh, the final version, which you can hear, is what I'll read now. Uh, you can, when you hit it down the zoo, it's read out by lots of different people. I'm, I've read a couple of lines, staff members read lines. We had children of staff members reading various bits of the poems. And this final version went through quite a few drafts. Again, getting, getting individual words right, getting rhythms right, uh, getting the individual animals in it because we wanted to capture the wildlife. So it came down to decisions like, um, are we going to have the Murray cod in it? Are there going to be crocodiles in it or swans or pelicans? Which particular things? What's it going to sound like? What kind of rhythm is it going to have? So this is the final version, which I, which I hope you'll like. And I hope next time you go to the zoo, you can, you can hear all the other wonderful people reading it doing a better job than me. So this poem's called Reflections on Water. And you'll tell straight away, it's a very different kind of poem. What do you see? Gleaming shimmers, silver swimmers, waders, striders, swoopers, divers, croakers, callers, lone mud crawlers, wrigglers, mopers, gulpers, gropers, from spring to shining sea. Through doubt and flood, in salt and mud, the rivers winding, toiling, shaping, roiling, rippling, cooling, snaking, pooling, trickling, draining, all sustaining, in depths and shallows, past farm and fallow, carving its way as it goes. Drinking, floating, soaking, boating, surfing, diving, splashing, thriving. Look at water long enough and you'll see yourself. 
in the ripples and foam with the cod and the pelican. We are the water sprites of this dry earth, dependent upon the crystal tonic that bathes us from our birth. Our words dance on wave tops like birds, but our music taps a deeper current still, as the river always downhill to where the tree roots of truth are growing, groping, thinking, drinking, digging fast into the soil. The river runs, and so do we, birds and people, creatures and trees, swimming reflected in water. And that was the final poem, which I hope captures the sense of the river rolling and tumbling and lots of things living in it. And every time I read that, I end up needing to do a wee. So, <laughs> I suspect the toilets of the zoo are running over time <laughs> now because of that poem. So science and words, words and science, science fiction, poems, very much what I do, very much what Saiku is all about. Thank you very much to, for the Royal Institute for promoting both. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for having me. Well, I think we'd agree that was psychotastic. What do you think? Give him another round of applause. Thanks very much, Sean. And this is all about worlds colliding, science and words and poetry and art. And the per next person that I'm going to introduce is a perfect example of someone who's dedicated quite a considerable amount of her life towards this end. I'm going to introduce Erica Jolly. She's a poet, writer and teacher. Uh, she served on Flinders University Council and its academic senate for 12 years after she stopped working for the Department of Education. Um, she reads her work at Friendly Street almost every month. She rarely misses and is a very popular reader there. A lot of her poetry is about science, about politics, about her main interests in life. She's had a beautiful book of poetry published called Pomegranates, which if it's, you can still get any copies of it, I really urge you to try to find it. Her latest book um, is called Challenging the Divide, Approaches to Science and Poetry. And she really documents the long history of where they've been together. Uh, and I can only recommend it. It's published by Lithrian Press in Adelaide and it was launched by Robin Williams back in March 2010. And in it, she explores that nexus between science and the arts. So I'd like to welcome Erica Jolly to the stage, please. Thank you, Maggie. I've had to change what I'm going to do very radically, I was going to be, um, I was going to show how exasperated I got at the National Science Week launch, because uh, I came to hear what was going to happen. And, uh, oh, well, I'll stay exasperated. Um, the, uh, we were told uh, that there was going to be a massive wow factor and that Joe Blow was always interested in inventions and Australia would be inspired. Well, I'm not one for wow factors. They are like fireworks that go out very fast and they smell of gunpowder. And as for Joe Blow, I didn't hear a single Josephine Blow mentioned. And um, I came... And then, of course, when I got Australia was going to be inspired, I thought, where are the people? So I dared in that audience to say, is there any place in National Science Week for humanities? And there was a roar of laughter. I don't know whether it was for me or against me, but that was the result. So I'm um, not reading a poem. I want to deal with a man I've fallen in love with, we've never met. He is the Nobel Prize winning quantum chemist, Roald Hoffman. He is a poet and he's a playwright. And I want to tell his story because it is the story of 
a civilised human being. And ultimately, that's where the sciences and the humanities should be meeting. Roald Hoffman still works at Cornell University. He sent me the most beautiful postcard um, because he let me use his poems for free and he let me um, quote from his essays. His, he cares so much about chemistry and this is the International Year of Chemistry that he produced these two wonderful books. One of them I have here, it's called Chemistry Imagined, Reflections on Science. Uh, the, um, the stories are short. It's brilliantly illustrated by Vivian Torrance with collages that encourage you to think and see and feel more widely. Uh, but his story is a really important one. Uh, one day, one day this will become a poet, poem. It'll take me a long time. It took me six months to write the poem I read here about Primo Levi, who's another of the civilised human beings that we should be taking notice of. Um, he was born in part of Poland in 1937 when the Germans invaded and forced all the Jews into the ghettos, he escaped with his father and mother. His father decided to try to help other Jews to escape before the mass killings and deportations and Hitler's final solution began. His scheme to break out was betrayed and Hillel Safran, his son carries that name. God, I hate it when this happens was executed by the Germans. The young boy and his mother were hidden and protected by people in the Ukraine. Roald would have known Hebrew by then, be speaking Polish, understanding Russian and German. They fled west, finally entering, entering Germany as displaced persons. And in um, Chemistry Imagined, he says, in 1947, I was 10 years old. We were in a displaced persons camp in Basselar Fingen, then in the French occupied zone of post war Germany, waiting for a visa to come to the United States. Or maybe we'd go to Israel. Or in the deepest moments when the visa seemed unattainable, my stepfather, he took the name of Hoffman uh, from his stepfather, he remembers him as a very kind and gentle human being, even thought of signing a labour contract in exchange for a visa to work in the mines in Chile. Things were so desperate. However, they were lucky. Uh, they went to USA. He was at Stuyvesant High School, one of the selective science schools in New York, and later he developed a fascination of chemistry. At that school, and I'm... Um, reading from the material that he wrote for the Nobel Prize. He not only mixed with students who would become scientists, but with writers and historians. In his undergraduate years at Columbia University, he says, the world that opened up for me in my non-science courses is what I remember best from my Columbia years. I almost switched to art history. Years later, when chemistry had become the centre of his interests in 1981, he would win the Nobel Prize for chemistry with a fellow scientist, Kenichi Fukui, uh, and quoting, for their theories developed independently concerning the course of chemical reactions. But why he matters here today is that he was never just a chemist. He was never just a scientist. Same as I'm glad to see that some people are never just poets. He was a human being concerned with ethics and he cared about poetry. He cared about it so much because it demands concern for words. And it seemed obvious to him as a teacher, as a researcher, that he had to be able to use the words in the best way possible. And um, he wrote, 
I write poetry to penetrate the world around me and to comprehend my reactions to it. He went on to say, there are several reasons to welcome more poetry that deals with science. He made the following comment, among others. Around the time of the Industrial Revolution, perhaps in reaction to it, perhaps for other reasons, science and its language left poetry. Nature and the personal became the main playground of the poet. That's too bad for both scientists and poets, but it leaves lots of open ground for those of us who can move between the two. If one can write poetry about being a lumberjack, I think of Robert Frost, why not about being a scientist? It's experience, a way of life. It's exciting. But more than this, and this is, um, I'm sorry, uh, where I'm coming to is, um, is where the sciences and the poetries and poetry began seriously to divide. He worried very much about how the scientists had been able to wash their hands of their responsibility for the way their discoveries were used. He wrote a poem, Fritz Haber. It's in uh, Chemistry Imagined, Reflections on Science. It's also in, in my book, Challenging the Divide. He let me use it. He and Alan Lightman, who's the astrophysicist, who's a novelist at, and uh, essayist at MIT, both let me have everything for free. <laughs> Lovely people. But in this poem about Fritz Haber, who was also a Jew, who was also a very, very, very great chemist, Fritz Haber um, was so different from Hoffmann. Fritz Haber wanted his talent recognised. He wanted to be at the top of the German academic tree and so he gave up his Jewish faith, became a Lutheran, because that's the way he would get into German academia. And he was responsible uh, for the use of chlorine gas in World War I. And he watched it. He, he was being objective. Took it, was there, took, took notes. Um, they used another kind of it on the Eastern Front, which was worse. And I have a feeling that that helped the Russians to withdraw and helped the Russian Revolution to take place. After the war, Haber developed the idea and um, encouraged it everywhere that the human catalyst responsible for the discovery had nothing to do with the way in which it was used. The human catalyst was innocent. And he talked about the depersonalization of science. What a lovely idea if you didn't ever want to have to think outside of that narrow tunnel vision. Oh, it became very popular. It still is. Uh, I was told the other day that science is only about how, it's not about why or any of the other questions. So, Roald Hoffman wrote this incredible poem about Fritz Haber, that the human catalyst is not innocent, that it has an effect, and that it must take that effect on board one way or another, at one time or another. And he knows, and it's in everything he writes, because he'll quote from William Blake's Tiger, he'll quote from Wilfred Owen's Dolce Air Decorum Est, thinking about the deaths from choking and poison gas in World War I. He knows that our humanity is at the base of what we do, and it is the quality of our thinking, it is the quality of our feeling that influences what happens. And so one of the important little essays that he's written that is in um, The Same and Not the Same, it's a sort of companion book to this, is chemistry, education, 
and democracy. Because he says, the brilliant chemists will come along. But he cares about the rest of us and about the quality of our thinking and the quality of our theory. And I could go on for a long time, but I'm not going to. You'll probably be pleased to hear that. He wrote in, um, in Chemistry Imagined about how he discovered Marie Curie and George Washington Carver at the age of 10. He was, as he said, he was in this displaced person's camp and he was reading in German translations, books about both of them. And I've written this poem, which I'm probably going to change, but anyway. It's called Connecting with the General Reader and it's based on chemistry imagined reflections on science by Roald Hoffman and Vivian Torrance, published by the Smithsonian Institute Press, 1993. Because I do not see them does not mean they're not there, nor that I'm not made of them. But this quantum chemist, poet and playwright will help me to learn to go beneath the skin, discover the stories of molecules and elements because this fine teacher moves beyond the abstract to delight in my world, inhabited by people who laugh, cry, write, search, struggle, find, because he feels the soldiers choking to death in dolce e decorum est, and he brings me stories, one of George Washington Carver, a black American scientist who would make glue from sweet potato and from peanuts, coffee and ink. I think you would all agree that clearly that is a very passionate person who has put all her feeling into every, every single thing she does. And funnily enough, I actually was going to read this later, but because Erica's referred to it and because I respect her so much um, and because we've got a little bit of time, I'm going to actually read you the poem that she referred to because I think it's very important that chemists always do remember in this year of chemistry that their work has um, outcomes. And I am going to read the poem because it's my favourite poem I've ever read called Dolce et Decorum Est. And it's got the last line, Pro Patria More, which means basically it's a sweet thing to die for your country, which is what they said to all the young men going to war in the First World War when people gave out the white feathers if they didn't bother going. And so this is what happens. <clears throat> in a gas attack as the men are trudging back to their rest for a while and then a gas attack occurs. And this is by my favourite poem, poet, Wilfred Owen. So this is dedicated to you, Erica, because I know that your life has been dedicated to trying to make people aware of humanity and its responses. Dulce et decorum est, bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf 
even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets on just in time, but someone was yelling and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning, if in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted froth lungs, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some glory, the old lie, dolce et decorum est, pro patria more. I'll now turn. So thank you, Erica, for reminding us to be human. <laughs>